so I'm, I'm going to start this lecture. Uh, f feel free to interrupt me by asking uh, as, as many questions as, as you want. Um, right. So uh, yeah, first of all, I should I should thank the Schrodinger Institute to give me this opportunity to uh, to give this uh, series of, of mini course. Uh, that's you know a great chance. So I'm I'm very grateful for that. I'm also grateful uh, to the University of Vienna and to the uh, uh, to the Pauli Institute to to host me. Uh, in this in this challenging year that we are going through. So, uh, right. So the, the subject of this meeting uh, and of this uh, series of, of mini course uh, will be the stability of of solitons in uh, nonlinear dispersive equations. Uh, so, solitons are. Uh, very uh, ubiquitous uh, phenomenon in, in nonlinear physics, I should say, um, in, in the physics of uh, Hamiltonian systems in general, uh, or uh, partial differential equations uh, uh, of, a, of a dispersive nature. Uh, so, you know, they occur in uh, general relativity, where they are called uh, black holes in uh, quantum mechanics, in, you know, many fields of um, continuous mechanics, fluids, plasmas, elasticity, uh, and in particle physics, field theories, etc. So they're uh, all over the place. They are very important objects. And, and uh, as always in physics, to be really important and relevant, these objects better be stable. If they're not stable under perturbations, uh, they should not be observed or only in very uh, sort of exceptional circumstances. So the question of their stability is, is absolutely crucial. And uh, the aim of this mini course is to present a few tools to uh, understand their stability um, rigorously uh, using uh, mathematical tools. So the tools we will use uh, resort to uh, harmonic analysis and functional analysis in, 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 in general. And I should say that uh, we will restrict to uh, a particular case, which is that of dimension one. So we, we think of equations uh, of one space variable and one time variable. So this is simpler. Uh, as far as the geometry goes. Basically, there is no geometry in the problem. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, the, the spectral theory, as we will see, is, is also simpler in one dimension. It reduces to uh, basically ODEs, uh, which, which you, know, you can understand in, in finite time in, in dimension one. So that's the simpler aspects of the dimension one. Now, there are also uh, more challenging uh, questions in dimension one, and uh, specifically the fact that uh, waves decay slower in dimension one, as is well known. Uh, you know, heuristically speaking, it's because they have less room to spread, so they, they decay like one over t to the one half, typically, instead of one over t to the d over two in, in dimension d. And of course, the less decay you are, uh, the, the less stable objects are, because decay is, is really the first um, cause of, of stability. Yes? Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know. And uh, Michel, do, so you, you can hear me all right, and the picture is, is OK, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. I was I was a bit nervous because it took a bit of time to set up. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, okay, great. So these few words were to convince you of the importance of um, of solitons, and I hope you're convinced. Uh, maybe I can say a few word a few words on the on, on the history of the subject. So you know there is a, a famous uh, first observation um, by.
by at least recorded uh, scientifically recorded observation by uh, Russell uh, in 1844. So he was, uh, I think, on horseback in the Scottish countryside. And then he saw basically a traveling wave, uh, you know, traveling on a canal. Uh, so it's, it's a famous, uh, you know, article. Let me read a few lines from it because it's, it's written in a very nice English and it's, it's, a, it's a nice story. So here is John Scott Russell uh, recalling its, uh, w what happened. I believe I shall best introduce this phenomenon by describing the circumstances of my own first acquaintance with it. I was observing the motion of a boat which was rapidly drawn along a narrow channel by a pair of horses. When the boat suddenly stopped, not so the mass of water in the channel which it had put in motion. It accumulated round the prow of the vessel in a state of violent agitation. Then, suddenly leaving it behind, rolled forward with great velocity, assuming the form of a large solitary elevation, a rounded, smooth and well-defined heap of water, which continued its course along the channel, apparently without change of form or diminution of speed. Okay, so it goes on, but you get the idea that was a, a, um, basically a, a traveling wave, uh, which, which he observed, and that's, you know, uh, basically these very words, uh, continued its course without change of form or diminution of speed. That's, that's what a, a traveling wave or a solitary wave or a soliton is. And I, I will use these words uh, interchangeably, though uh, sometimes people make a difference. Maybe sometimes solitons uh, are, are reserved to the completely integrable case. Uh, and solitary waves is, is more general, but I will not make any distinction. Okay, so there was this observation by uh, John Scott Russell, 1844, and uh, the leading, you know, British, British scientist of the time, um, uh, Stokes and Airy, who, who worked in, in fluid mechanics, uh, basically, you know, could not figure out how to explain this because they had mostly linear theories. Uh, so it, it, it took until 1870 for Boussinesque to, to suggest an interpretation of, of this observation of, of uh, uh, John Scott Russell. And in 1895, uh, Corteveg and De Vries wrote down their, their famous equation, uh, which we will come back to, which uh, is, is, is a model of, of this sort of, of long wave that uh, John Scott Russell was, was describing. So by the end of the 19th century, you know, there was at least the governing equations that were in place. Um, then um, important things happened in the 50s and 60s. So there was the Fermi pasta Willem experiment, uh, which, which is about an infinite dimensional or, you know, uh, uh, nonlinear Hamiltonian system of large dimension. Um, and, and what they observed numerically, this was the f sort of the first uh, numerical experiments that, that people could do. What they observed numerically is that uh, it did not thermalize as, as uh, quickly as it, as it should have. I mean, it really did not thermalize. So um, energy did, did not equidistribute in the system. And they were a bit at a loss to explain this. Um, and so it's believed that sort of solitons uh, are, are part of the answer to, to this uh, observation by Fermi, Pasta, and Ulam. Um, and then there was the realization that certain equations are completely integrable. Uh, so there was, in particular, a work of Lax. And uh, uh, so Lax in the US, uh, Shabbat in, in the USSR. Uh, who realized, you know, what complete integrability is about. And at the same time, there was also the school around Zaharov in, in the USSR uh, that, that was working on, on wave turbulence, uh, which is yet another aspect of uh, nonlinear dispersive equations. More recently, uh, in the 90s and 2000s, uh, many people in the mathematical community started working on this question. 
uh, with a lot of input uh, from harmonic analysis, in particular, um, uh, Bourguin and, and Tao had a very uh, uh, decisive uh, input to this, to this field. Um, okay, so that's a very brief uh, history of the subject. Um, maybe what are the most important questions in the, in the field? Um, so I, I think there are two. Okay, so I'm going to try and write on this, on this board. So, um, so first, uh, it's possible setup is if the equation is, uh, equation set in the whole space, say RD. So then, uh, there is, um, a conjecture which is known as the soliton resolution conjecture. Uh, sorry, Trish, uh, how can one uh, plot the screen and see this very tiny dots? Well, it's, it's written too small, you mean? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm yes. wondering, can I bl blow it up somewhere? You can pin um, the video chat again on three dots at the top right oh, of your screen. And then oh, great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Sorry. Okay, great. Thank you. Is it, is it big enough? Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, right. So, if you set the equation in RD, uh, okay, so I haven't discussed, you know, uh, given examples of, of, of uh, the equations that we will study, uh, but think of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, NLS, for instance, that we will define soon. Um, so basically, uh, the picture uh, that should emerge if you set this equation in the whole space is given by this conjecture. And what does this conjecture say? It says that the solution, so generically, okay, so part of the question is what does generically mean? But Let's not worry about that. Generically, the solution should split as time goes to infinity, so as t goes to infinity, into uh, a linear solution. And linear solutions are decaying, as we will see, plus a bunch of traveling wave solutions, so qi of x minus v i t. So you have this uh, linear solution which is which is decaying because the equation we are thinking of is dispersive, and these are the um, uh, traveling waves. Uh, so you see, just like in the text of John Scott Russell, uh, there is the profile q i which is fixed, and then they are traveling at a, at a fixed velocity in 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 space. And so, you know, the mechanism, so why would this happen is, is uh, sort of a bit of a mystery. Why would such a configuration be stable is, is less of a mystery because this linear piece is decaying and these solitons are, are traveling away from each other, right? So asymptotically, uh, there, there is very few um, possible interaction between the various pieces in, in, this, in this sum. Which, which makes it sensible to expect something like that. Uh, but so basically this uh, conjecture is, is open in uh, most cases. It's only known for completely integrable equations and um, for very specific models. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's known for the uh, critical wave equation in dimension three in the radial case, which, which is a, you know, a, very impressive achievement, but w which still is a very partial understanding of, of this uh, conjecture. So um, this series of lectures will focus on the stability of just one of these guys interacting with the linear piece of the solution. Right? So instead of uh, looking at generic data that should split like that, we're looking at, at data that look like soliton plus a small linear piece 
and we're trying to understand whether this is stable. So in other words, what we are doing, what we will be doing in this, in this set of lectures is sort of step zero uh, towards uh, the soliton resolution conjecture. Okay, so that's if the equation is set in RD. Now you might, uh, you might ask what happens if the equation is set on a compact set, uh, let's say on the torus, TD, just for, you know, to give a specific example. Now, uh, this, this conjecture cannot hold anymore because the, the basic mechanism for stability was decay of the linear piece and the fact that the solitary waves were, were traveling away from each other. Of course, if you're on a compact set, n none of this is true. So uh, this soliton resolution conjecture cannot hold anymore. Uh, and then it's not even clear what to, what to expect if you set the equation in, on the torus. Uh, in other words, it's very hard to understand the, the large time behavior of um, infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system. Um, so one keyword is, is weak turbulence. Uh, there is a prediction that the system should enter sort of a, a chaotic regime, but it's sort of, nothing is clear. Nothing is clear. Uh, yeah. I don't see the last line of your oh. The equation set in the torus, but then it stops. So someone might, I don't know. Thank you. No, I, I think everybody is. Yes. Sorry about that. So I, I won't write that law. The last line was just weak turbulence. So you, you, you didn't, uh, you didn't miss much. But thanks for telling me. Um, okay. So, uh, so that's the sort of very big picture. Uh, and so there are, you know, many things we don't understand. But what we're going to try and understand is, is you know, this sub problem which is how about, you know, one soliton uh, and its uh, stability properties. Okay, so uh, maybe I'm going to give a, a plan of the next lectures. Uh, so I should try and erase. All right. Oh, it's it's not perfect, but it's it's okay. Uh, okay. So uh, now let me give you give you an outline of of the next lectures. So uh, so plan. So today is uh, you know uh, introduction. Uh, next time we will look at the question of uh, orbital stability. I will tell you what that is. Uh, which essentially boils down to uh, a variational method. Um, then we will discuss uh, the flat case. Okay, by flat case, I mean, instead of considering the, the question of the stability of a soliton, we think of the stability of the zero solution. And, and then uh, we will uh, be using a dispersive and strict art estimate. Uh, 
Uh, okay, then um, then we will want to try and understand what happens uh, if you perturb a, a soliton. So if you perturb a soliton, the first thing to try and do is to linearize around it. And if you linearize around it, what comes out is a Schrodinger operator. And it's important to uh, understand the spectral resolution of this Schrodinger operator. And there is a theory which is known as the uh, Weil Kodaira Teach Marsh theory. Which allows you to construct a Fourier transform adapted to a given Schrodinger operator, so minus Laplace and plus Z. Basically, the idea is that if you look at the at the um, flat Laplacian, so just the Laplacian, if you look at the Laplacian, it is diagonalized by the Fourier transform, right? Because if you take the Fourier transform of the Laplacian, it's just a multiplication operator. Of course, the same is not true if instead of the Laplacian, you consider minus Laplacian plus a potential V which is why you want an adapted notion of a Fourier transform, and this is what the weil kodaira teach marsh theory gives you. Okay. Uh, then uh, we will discuss, so armed with this uh, weil kodaira teach marsh theory, we will discuss uh, asymptotic stability, asymptotic stability of solitons, uh, through uh, decay estimates and then uh, instead of using decay we will try and use uh, uh, resonances and finally we will discuss the question of uh, modulation Uh, right, so that's 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 the plan. Uh, so I, I think uh, maybe the begin the first two lectures are more classical, and and the last ones cover less classical material. Uh, so it's you know it, it will uh, get more and more interesting. Uh, maybe I should I should say a word of the literature on this subject. Unless you have any questions on the on the plan. Oops, yes. Thank you so much. I just like the name. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so literature uh, what are nice books uh, so uh, these are broad presentations of, of nonlinear dispersive equations so of course there is the book by Tao which is called nonlinear dispersive equations local and global analysis which is great uh, and, and goes pretty far. Um, and it is, is more concerned about uh, semilinear problems. Uh, there is the book by uh, Linares and Ponce, which uh, I think goes at a gentler pace and which uh, explores uh, more uh, 
quasi-linear problems. Uh, there is a, a very nice lecture note by Shata and Struve. So it's called uh, geometric wave equations. And so it, they have more of a geometric uh, point of view on this question, or they, they are interested in uh, equations with a more geometric um, content, like wave maps. And uh, finally, there is uh, the book by Erdogan and Syrakis. Uh, which contains a very nice presentation of uh, XSB spaces. So all of these books are, are great, and I can only recommend them. Uh, but I, I, but they, they focus more on typically uh, local well posedness questions. And I don't think there is a good reference on, on the subject that is, that is uh, going to be treated during this mini course, namely stability of, of uh, of uh, solitons, I don't think there is a at least a, a, a good textbook that that covers that. So that that's why I, I thought it would be it would be useful to to discuss it. Okay. Uh, all right, so, so now I can present the, the main characters that will uh, occupy us, which are the uh, NLS and the KDV equation. So uh, let, let me write them. So the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Um, So let me write it in this form. So U is a map from uh, the time variable T, the space variable X, to the complex numbers. And the equation it satisfies is IVT U minus VX squared U equals G or okay. 2g prime of u squared u. So where, where g is, is a, a potential function that looks like that. So that's g. So that's the first character. Second character is the KDV equation. So NLS for nonlinear Schrodinger and KDV for Kortovec de Vries. So now uh, U is, is real valued. And the equation it satisfies is E to U. So the same thing, F has a, you know, is a nice, uh, say, convex function with a minimum at zero. So that's F. Okay, so I, I think these are two, maybe the two most important equations of the, of the theory. Um, so 
it's generalized versions because we have these potential functions uh, g and f uh, which uh, for the classical kdv equation you would just have dx u squared and for the classical nls equation you would have uh, g prime being the identity so you would have u squared u um, but it's it's interesting to have um, more general uh, potential functions, you, you, you can observe a richer set of uh, phenomena. Why are these two equations uh, so canonical? So physically, they, 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 they share a certain universal character. So the KDV equation typically is going to describe a long wave uh, phenomena. So these are phenomena for which the um, uh, the, 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 the wavelength is, is large compared to other elements of the, of the system. And the nonlinear Schrodinger equation uh, describes um, modulation uh, phenomena, so it's more like a carrier wave uh, type uh, situation. So you have a certain wave with, with an envelope and, and the nonlinear Schrodinger equation describes in a universal way um, how the, the envelope with, will evolve. I, I, will, I will tell more about that uh, if, if time permits. Uh, so we'll see that uh, both of these equations admit uh, traveling waves. And, and the question that will occupy us is you know, uh, whether these this traveling waves are, are stable. Uh, but the, the methods that we will use and that, that I will uh, present apply to you know, a, a very great range of, of equations. These two are interesting because, well, first, they are pretty canonical. And second, uh, they are sufficiently easy to write, so we will not get too much uh, lost in, in notations. Uh, so maybe I can present a little bit the Hamiltonian structure behind these equations. I think it, it makes a bit more sense of what, uh, what the symmetries are and what the conserved quantities are to uh, Noether's theorem. So let, let me try and explain that. And of course, if you have any questions, please, please ask. It's, it's always a bit uh, impersonal through, through Zoom. So the more questions, uh, the merrier. Okay, so uh, I'm going to explain what the, what the Hamiltonian or the symplectic structure behind NLS or KDV is. Uh, and I need to first uh, set up a, 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 a few notations. So uh, everything starts with a Hamiltonian function. Ah, writing is in black is not a great idea. Uh, let's try, this is better, yeah. So Hamiltonian function. H of u. Which is defined on a certain, you know, vector space or Banach space or I, I, I'm, I'm not wor worrying about a rigor. I just want to present the, 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 the structure behind the equations. Uh, so that's the Hamiltonian. Uh, it has a gradient uh, that's 
that can be defined as follows. Uh, so gradient. So uh, you look at the uh, perturbation of the argument, epsilon is small, then this is h of u plus the gradient, sorry, epsilon times the gradient of the Hamiltonian applied to phi plus O of epsilon phi. Right, so that's the reasonable way of defining a gradient. Um, you can understand this gradient as a, as a linear form and by duality it's the same if, if you're in a Hilbert space uh, by duality it's the same as as an element of the of the Hilbert space uh, then we have a, a symplectic form omega uh, that is anti-symmetric and non-degenerate. And through this symplectic form, we can define the uh, symplectic gradient. Uh, so it's uh, denoted grad sub omega. And it's, it's such that uh, maybe let's see it like that. So it, it is such that omega of grad omega h of u phi is grad h of u applied to phi. So it's, you know, the symplectic gradient is, is defined by duality uh, using the uh, symplectic form in, in, a, in a natural way. And then the symplectic flow associated to this Hamiltonian is given by uh, DTU equals gradient. So the symplectic gradient of the Hamiltonian of you. Uh, Okay, so examples, example, if you take the Hamiltonian to be uh, the H1 norm, so I'm, I'm dropping constant plus the potential function G of U squared. And if you take the symplectic form omega of UV, to be the imaginary part integral u v bar v x, you can make a small computation, and and what comes out is NLS, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And if instead of uh, imaginary part of u v bar, you take uh, integral of u d x v dx inverse v, uh, then what comes out is not NLS, but uh, KDV. Right, so this, this Hamiltonian function is, is uh, you know, very, very natural, right? It's a combination of the H1 norm and a certain potential term. So that's the most classical energy in uh, continuum mechanics. And, and uh, if you take this uh, standard symplectic form, what you get is, is NLS. Uh, okay, so this is interesting uh, abstract nonsense, uh, but, but it, 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 it has a, a nice... Um, so putting things in, in, in this form uh, is, is uh, enlightening because of uh, Noether's theorem. So I'm, I'm going to state and prove Noether's theorem, but perhaps you have uh, questions. No, okay.
Yes. Is uh, the the synthetic gradient uh, does it, does it already exist or? Oh yes. So uh, this was this was all formal. Okay. Uh, there is a there is an assumption that the uh, symplectic form omega is anti-symmetric and, and non-degenerate. So if you're in finite dimension, uh, everything is fine. Now, if you're in infinite dimension, there are always questions of regularity that I, I just glossed over here. But of course, uh, you know you should uh, think about them in in general. Uh, but I, I should say uh, this this whole. Uh, uh, Hamiltonian structure, I, I think it's very helpful to to think of the problem in physical terms or to derive some intuition on the problem. But when it comes to doing estimates, uh, to doing actual you know analysis, you, 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 you never use it as such. So uh, you know even if it doesn't make sense rigorously, it's, it's not really a problem because that's that's not the main aim. Yes, exactly. So, uh, calculating the gradient is is not hard, right? You just uh, expand the h1 norm and you expand the uh, nonlinear function g. So, so that's that's easy. This gives you the uh, classical gradient, and then uh, from there and the symplectic form, you can you can derive the symplectic gradient. It's it's a few line computation. And, and a very good exercise. Okay, so uh, now let me let me state a Noether's theorem and prove it because the proof is actually uh, very easy. So what what's hard is to get used to you know these notations and these uh, symplectic ideas. So okay, so we have our uh, Hamiltonian H that generates a certain uh, symplectic flow dTU equals gradient, symplectic gradient of H. Ouch, you cannot see that. Let me try to... Oops. Yes. Okay, so we have our Hamiltonian that, that's generating uh, a certain uh, symplectic flow. And then suppose there is another function uh, let's call it f that generates another symplectic flow and uh, we're gonna call it s uh, so uh, dtu equals uh, gra symplectic gradient of f we're gonna call this symplectic flow st okay and and the idea is that we we think of the first one as the evolution problem we are we are looking at, and we think of the second one as as a symmetry of the problem. But of course, uh, if you write them like that, both uh, are, are you know just of the same form. So what Noether's theorem is saying you is that uh, 
the function f is conserved by the uh, evolution star, if and only if, Uh, S T is a symmetry of H, which means that H of S T U equals H of U. Oh, maybe, sorry. Right. So, uh, so, so what this is saying is that the so the symmetries of the Hamiltonian are are these uh, symplectic uh, transformations that leave the Hamiltonian invariant. Okay, and finding a symmetry of the Hamiltonian that has this uh, symplectic form is equivalent to finding the functions that are conserved by this uh, nonlinear flow. Uh, okay, so let me just write the proof. It's it's very easy, and then I will uh, un unpack a little bit what this means. So uh, let's let's assume that u solves uh, the equation star, and let's look at the evolution dt of f of u, right? So f, f is a certain, you know, function on uh, the solution and we want to know how f of u evolves. So basically we're just going to apply the definitions. So by definition, this is the gradient of f of u applied to dtu. And uh, here I'm not worrying about rigor. I'm just say let's say we're in finite dimension and everything makes sense. Okay, but by, by definition, uh, grad f of u applied to dtu is omega of grad omega f of u. So that's for the uh, gradient f of u part, and dtu is grad omega h of u. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to do the same computation uh, for h of st of u, and we're going to see that we find the same expression. So if one is zero, the other is zero. So let's do the same computation for dt h s t u uh, maybe let's call it uh, phi here so that's a bit different uh, so by definition this is the gradient of h of s t phi applied to the time derivative of s t phi the time derivative of s t phi is the gradient Symplectic gradient. Uh, maybe this is sorry. Whoops. So here dt st phi. But this is the symplectic gradient. Grad omega f st phi. So this whole thing. Uh, by definition of the symplectic gradient is omega of grad h of st phi, uh, grad omega h of st phi, grad omega f of st phi. So if, if one is zero, then the other is zero. So there is this uh, very nice and far-reaching equivalence between the quantities that are conserved by the nonlinear evolution and uh, the symmetries of the of the Hamiltonian. Uh, so maybe I let's apply this theorem to the case of NLS. 
uh, to see what it gives. Uh, but perhaps you have uh, questions. I, mostly, this is this is all, uh, you know, just manipulating definitions. Uh, but I, I understand it can take time to get used to them. So if you have questions, please please ask. So the symmetry ST is generated by, uh, is, is the symplectic flow associated to uh, the function F. Sorry, let me just... So, uh, uh, is there a, um, do, does one know all uh, uh, all these symmetries of the understanding here? Uh, yeah, and that's. I'm 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 not sure if there is. So, okay, it's expected that there are no other. I don't know if there is a formal proof. That's that's a good question. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, right, so let's let's do this for for the NLS equation. So NLS. So uh, the Hamiltonian, as I was saying, is uh, so sometimes I'm dropping constants, but here I'm putting them in. Oh, sorry, it's a minus a minus. Um, and the symplectic form omega of fg is the integral of f, uh, sorry, imaginary part, fg bar dx. So if you do a, s a small computation, you realize first that the gradient of H is, uh, right, so, 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 so now, um, so gradient of H of U, it's, so if we want to write it as a linear form, so gradient H of U applied to phi, it's the integral of dx squared u plus uh, uh, g prime of u squared times u against phi. Uh, I think there should be a bar and here a real part. I think that's what you get from the computation. And I, th okay, more or less the signs are correct. Uh, 
and then from there you see that the uh, symplectic gradient is uh, just i dx squared u plus g prime of u squared. And, and therefore, the uh, equation is, uh, we said, uh, dtu equals i dx squared u Uh, yes, yeah, so maybe I'm not very consistent in, in uh, s assigning uh, signs, but, uh, you know, most signs do not matter, and the ones that do matter, I'm, I'm trying to, to get them right. Okay, so that's, that's uh, how you derive NLS from this Hamiltonian uh, with this uh, symplectic form. So now let's, uh, let's try to apply uh, Noether's theorem. Uh, yes. So Noether's theorem gives this correspondence between, on the one hand, symmetries of the Hamiltonian, so through Noether's theorem, and on the other hand, uh, conserved quantities. So these are symmetries of the Hamiltonian. Uh, okay, so if you look at this Hamiltonian, the first obvious uh, symmetry is a phase rotation. So if, if, if you take U and you map it to E to the I theta times U, so you multiply by a complex number of, of modulus 1, then the Hamiltonian uh, remains invariant. So you can uh, understand this symmetry as, as the symplectic flow associated to a, a certain quantity, which is conserved, and this quantity turns out to be the so-called uh, mass. So the L2 norm. So that's, that's the, the first one. The second obvious symmetry is translation. So space translation. Obviously, uh, the Hamiltonian is invariant by space translation. So if, if uh, you work it out, you see that this is the uh, symplectic flow associated to a, a certain quantity, which turns out to be the uh, momentum. Uh, which is the real part. Okay, so there is another conserved quantity, which is the Hamiltonian, uh, but there is no real counterpart. Um, right, so not, not everything fits exactly nicely into Noether's theorem. But the Hamiltonian is, is, is always conserved, so h of u. So let's just think a, a minute about uh, what, what these quantities are. So uh, the mass, so, you know, from a PDE, but even from a physical viewpoint, what's important is the conserved quantities which are coercive. That is, that give you some sort of uh, 
effective bound on the solution. And that's obviously the case of the mass, right? The mass controls the L2 norm of the solution. The L2 norm of the solution is constant in time, so that's, that's something. In particular, if you develop a singularity, it can only happen in such a way that the uh, L2 norm is, is constant. So, you know, this excludes certain types of, of singular behaviors. Uh, well, the second quantity, the momentum, is not so useful because it doesn't have a sign, right? And it can be zero without, you know, implying that u is, is small in any sense. Uh, so it's, it's useful in some respects, but it's much less useful than, than uh, positive quantities such as the mass. And, uh, you know, finally, how much control the Hamiltonian implies on the solution u is a question that we'll uh, come back to. If instead of the negative sign there was a plus sign, uh, then obviously the Hamiltonian would be uh, coercive, uh, but there would not be solitons. So th this negative sign is necessary for the existence of um, solitons, uh, but it means that there is a competition between these two terms and um, how much uh, control this gives on u is, is a question that we'll uh, come back to. Okay, uh, but so it's, you know, it's one of the beauties of Hamiltonian systems that you have this uh, always exchange between symmetries and conserved quantities. Um, and well, if, if you're a PD person, of course, uh, you can also be more straightforward and just uh, derive directly from the equation that, that the uh, L2 norm is conserved, say. Uh, but it's very helpful to know where it's coming from, and this is also very much related to uh, uh, the question of stability of solitons, as we will see. Okay, and there is another important symmetry which does not really fit in, 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 into this framework, which is called the uh, Galilean symmetry. So the Galilean symmetry uh, works as follows. Say you have a solution u of tx of NLS. And then, uh, so if you modulate it, that is if you multiply it by a complex exponential, it's going to start moving at a complex, at, at a constant speed. So namely, if u is a solution of NLS, then for any C, uh, so there, there is a formula. So what does it mean? So you have a solution U, just a solution of NLS, and then you can think of it this way. So you multiply it. Uh, by a complex exponential in, in x, then what this will give you is uh, oscillations in time that maybe are not that important, but also a translation in x at a constant speed depending on xi. So what this means in particular is if you have a stationary solution of NLS or a just a constant solution. By applying this Galilean symmetry, what you find is a traveling wave uh, solution. And uh, this, will be, this will be useful. So it's just like a, you know, a, a miracle that is associated to uh, NLS. So the structure of KDV is um, much simpler because uh, KDV is, is real valued. So maybe I, I will not uh, discuss it uh, here. But I will uh, take some more time to uh, do a little bit of ODE analysis. Do you have any questions?
Okay, so a bit of ODE. A bit of ODE maze. Right, so basically the, the ODE that we need to understand is the following uh, minus psi double prime plus C C minus F prime of psi equals zero. Where where F okay so F has a, just a just a single well potential. That's nice in all respects. Uh, so the case where F has two wells is, is uh, very important and interesting, but I don't think we will have time to, um, to say anything. Uh, right, so for simplicity, we, we will assume that F is even, uh, so it has to be super linear at infinity. So uh, if F is convex, that's fine. Uh, right. Okay, so then uh, we can uh, draw the phase space diagram. So this is psi. This is psi prime. And well, basically the only observation you need is that there is a conserved quantity uh, along uh, solutions of this. So it's just a you know scalar second order. ODE. Uh, so there is a conserved quantity that you see by just uh, multiplying by C prime. The conserved quantity is, uh, let me write it here, conserved quantity is uh, minus C prime squared plus C over 2 C squared minus F of C. So the, the the phase diagram of this ODE simply corresponds to the level sets of these uh, conserved quantities. So so it's it's not very hard. And uh, you have uh, so the important thing is there is one heteroclinic orbit that goes like that. Uh, and same on the other side. Okay, and basically this uh, heteroclinic orbit is the solution we're looking for. Uh, so namely theorem. Uh, for any C positive, there exists a solution Psi. Uh, uh, let's call it C sub C because it, de it depends on the on the uh, real number C. Uh, so C looks like that, and it decays exponentially at infinity. Okay, so I, I hope w what I uh, said was is not too uh, cryptic, uh, but it's just uh, you know basic uh, ODE analysis, and and basically what we what we retain is the existence of this uh, solution PCC, which is going to provide us with uh, with uh, solitons. But please please let me know if if uh, something is not clear. Uh, you know, the, the m m most naive and uh, elementary questions are often the, the best ones because nobody dares to ask. And, uh, you know, if there is something not clear, you're probably not the, the only one to, uh, you know, have a problem. So please, please ask. Okay, so now we, we remember this, this result. Uh, and uh, we're just going to deduce from this uh, small piece of ODE analysis the existence of, of solitons for NLS and KDV.
so, so let, let me ask you a question. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 I missed a little bit of, of what you were saying. So this exponential decay is only in the positive direction. Is it or is it in both directions? So is this oh, e no. to minus cx or is it e minus e absolute value of x? Oh yes, thank you, that, that's a good point. It's uh, absolute value of x, yes. So the solution is, is even. And it's decaying in both uh, yes. directions. Yes. So, so it, it's not true that every solution does that, but there exists a solution which does that. That's the point? Uh, yes. That every solution decays exponentially? Uh, no, no, no. So you see in, in the phase diagram that I, that I drew, uh, only this uh, heteroclinic orbit is is decaying uh, but i think that's the that's the only so if you want finite energy or finite ma finite mass um, solitons then this is the the only possibility but typically uh, so solutions will uh, decay in one side and just grow grow on the other or something like that no, 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 solution. no, no. So, so you know, from this uh, phase uh, diagram, what you see is that you have this this solitons that I just uh, drew, and then well, I can do that. So, uh, how is it? So you have these guys, and then you have uh, solutions which are periodic, uh, like that. And then you have solutions which I think are periodic like that. Okay, so it's not true that every solution decays or something like that. So, it's something so I think there are one of these three types. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Right. So now let's apply this to NLS. So we, we start to so recall that NLS is given by uh, IDTU NLS mixed squared U equals G prime of U squared U. Uh, okay. And And right, and the convention is that g of u squared is f of u. f is the uh, f is the function that appeared in the ODE analysis uh, lecture. So now, if you start with the ansatz, u equals e to the i t omega. Uh, times p then the solution then the equation satisfied by phi is the one that we just wrote so uh, omega phi equals g expose p So that, that's just the, the ODE we, we discussed. Uh, omega was called f, and this was f prime, f prime. But so basically, that's, that's just the ODE we discussed. So if you look for solutions of this type, they're given by solutions of the ODE we, we, we just discussed. Uh, and as I was saying, uh, there is a unique solution that has finite mass, so finite L2 norm or finite energy, which means finite Hamiltonian. Okay, and it's, it doesn't move in, in, in space, it's uh, fixed in space, but there are these time oscillations that, uh, that come up. Okay. Um, now, if you apply the Galilean symmetry,
uh, you get the following family. Uh, so remember the Galilean symmetry maps solution solutions of NLS to other solutions of NLS. So here we have a family of solutions. So if we apply the Galilean symmetry, we get a more general family. There's no X here. Right, so it's just applying the Galilean symmetry with frequency C to this uh, ansatz. So now there are, there are two parameters, right? So this is a two parameter family. There is the omega, which is the somehow uh, time frequency. There is C, which is the uh, space frequency. And then uh, of course, uh, as we saw, NLS is invariant by a phase rotation. So you can always add here I theta. So this is a third parameter. And you can also add here uh, plus x naught, or, or rather minus x naught, because of the invariance by translation. So that's the fourth parameter. So overall, we, we are dealing with a four-parameter uh, family of, of traveling waves, uh, and and we, we are interested in improving uh, their uh, stability. Uh, so for KDV, the situation is simpler because there is no uh, Galilean symmetry, there is no phase rotation. Uh, so basically, you just have traveling waves with, uh, you know, shift in, in space. Um, okay, so maybe just to conclude, uh, let me just mention, you know, which notions of stability we will be discussing. I'm, I'm going a little bit over time, but we started a bit late. I have a good question. Yes. Uh, sorry. I think there's supposed to be a T against the omega. Uh, oh yeah, here is a T. Yes. Thank you. Okay. There was just in time before I erased. Thank you. Okay, so notions of stability. Okay, so the most naive one is uh, Lyapunov stability, which is just, uh, you know, the classical, the mo you know, the first thing you come up with. I'm saying, okay, so if you start close to a soliton, you remain, you remain close to it for any later time. However, this cannot hold as such because think of the following situation. So I have a soliton here that's traveling at a certain speed in phase space. Okay, so now I perturb it a tiny bit and I I find another soliton, well, it's actually very close to the first one, and it's traveling at a slightly different velocity. So, sorry, I should say this is space and this is time. And, and this uh, here reflects sort of the, where the soliton is localized. So it's gonna be localized around this line for the white one, and it's going to be localized uh, close to this uh, green line for the green one. Uh, so, okay, what, what do we learn from that? We learn from that that even though at time zero both were very close, at later time they d diverge, and so uh, Lyapunov stability typically uh, cannot hold. So we have to give up on that. Uh, a better idea is 
orbital stability. And this is asking that, you know, if you, if you start close to a soliton, you remain uh, close to the, the whole family of, of solitons. So in this case, it would work because, uh, you know, you start close to a soliton, then you, the perturbation is the green guy. The green guy is going to live its life, but it's going to remain a soliton. You're going to remain close to the whole family of solitons. Uh, so in other words, uh, so if you start, cl start close to a soliton, remain close to a soliton. But of course, it doesn't have to be the same one. That's the, that's the catch. And it's orbital because uh, you're, you're essentially remaining close to the orbit uh, of solitons under the symmetries of the equation. Uh, okay, so that's, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, but we expect something even better to be true, namely asymptotic stability. Yes, right. So for this uh, specific model, C has to be positive. Okay. Uh, and so uh, it's important for, for KDV, it means that solitons only travel in one direction. So for KDV, C the C that appeared in the ODE analysis uh, is actually the, the, the velocity of the, of the soliton. And so it's saying that uh, the soliton can only travel in one direction. For NLS, uh, C is the time frequency. So maybe it's, it has a less direct uh, you know, physical uh, relevance. And, and, because, so, and, and so for NLS, uh, solitons can travel in both directions, but for KDD, only one direction is allowed. Uh, right, and asymptotic stability, it's saying that uh, if you start close to a soliton, then as t goes to infinity, u splits into a linear solution plus a solution, plus a soliton, sorry. And as we will see, the linear solution goes to zero locally. Uh, so that's a toy version of the soliton resolution conjecture. It's saying that if you want the soliton resolution conjecture holds close to, if, if you start close to a soliton. So if you start close to a soliton, then as time goes by, uh, the solution splits into a linear solution that goes to zero locally and a soliton, which is perhaps not the same one as the one you started with. Uh, and we will, so as far as orbital stability, uh, you know, you can establish it easily. It goes back to the 70s, 80s. Uh, and essentially it boils down to uh, a variational analysis that we will do uh, next time. Now, as far as asymptotic stability goes, uh, you know, it's, it's a harder question that is, uh, you know, not answered in many cases of interest, uh, but for which, uh, you know, there are a couple of, of methods that I will uh, present. Okay, and this, this concludes my talk for today. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your attention. Sorry for the uh, little technical problems at the beginning, but I think now I, I got it. And uh, perhaps you have uh, some questions. I have probably quite a quick question. Yes? Are you defining a soliton as one of the real deformed ETI to omega bar? I, yes, uh, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, so mostly a, a soliton is a, a traveling wave. So something like uh, that has a fixed shape and that uh, travels at a fixed uh, velocity. So that's, for instance, for KDV, that's exactly what you have. 
So for NLS, uh, you know, the situation is a bit richer and you have stuff happening in the phase, but I, I still call it a, a, a soliton. And in general, you know, the more symmetries you have in the problem, uh, the, the richer the, the behavior. But basically, it's something that, that looks like a, a traveling wave with perhaps, you know, more complicated uh, uh, things happening. Um, yeah. Does this okay, answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Other questions? I have another question. When you introduced um, Galilean symmetry, mm -hmm. uh, was there... Um, Right, so that, that's a good point. So I, I, I don't think there is, so maybe you can, I, not that I know of, and the reason is that uh, Galilean symmetry uh, is also involving the time variable in a way that, that doesn't really go well with the Noether theorem. So maybe there is a way of putting things in, 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 in such a way that it, you know, it fits into Noether's theorem, but I, I don't think so. Um, other questions? Okay, if not, uh, thank you, thank you again, and I will see you. Uh, oh yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. Uh, what's the nature of the um, independent zone in it? Because I was one to see if there is uh, not really a symmetry behind it. Um, it's just a wave, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's also a good point. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's associated to a symmetry. So Noether theorem, it's, you know, it's very nice, but it doesn't quite cover, you know, all the cases. Uh, like the Galilean symmetry, and the Hamiltonian, I don't think they really have uh, counterparts as far as, as symmetries go. So yeah, that's 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 the way it is. Yeah. Uh, may I say something? A comment uh, is uh, physicists we are told well if the thing is there's a time translation there that's then means the full energy is conserved if you can associate this with Hamiltonian again if that's the concept then it would be fine. Ah yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's a good point. Yes, that's a very good point. Uh, so, uh, right. So the, the point you're making is that uh, all of these equations are invariant by time translation, and this is associ is associated through some version of Noether's theorem to the conservation of the Hamiltonian. But but the thing is, you would need to have a version of Noether's theorem that. Uh, not only acts in the space, but also in the space-time variable. But maybe something that exists, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, it's just that this is sort of the non-rigorous physics approach. <laughs> but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I agree that this is about the time variable. Thank you, yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a very good point. Uh, I just about what you said about conserved quantity and uh, H, but uh, isn't the symmetry of H uh, just the, the flow of the map uh, associated with H, the Hamiltonian. Like uh, H is a conserved quantity uh, because uh, the flow is a symmetry of the flow itself. Ah, uh, yes, right. That's that's even a better point. Yes, I I, I, I agree. I agree. You you are you're right. So it's sort of a it's sort of a limiting case of. I mean, it's a. Sort of logically, it's 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 true, right? Um, like no, like the sort of uh, it's saying something like the. Uh, I mean, it's uh, logically. I think if you apply if you apply Noether's theorem to F and H being the same guy, what what you get is that. Uh, the f the Hamiltonian is conserved uh, because the Hamiltonian is conserved or something like that, right? So it's it's sort of a, an empty statement. Uh, but okay, maybe let's not get <laughs> too much troubled by this uh, by these questions. Um, essentially, uh, 
yeah, essentially, uh, Newton's theorem doesn't work all the time. Maybe there is a version that works all the time. Uh, I, I don't know of it. Uh, and I can refer to uh, Tao's uh, notes are great. That's that's where I I, I found the best exposition of this of this uh, question. Uh, just uh, about uh, the last thing is uh, you were, you wrote uh, just uh, I was wondering uh, when you said you use uh, a linear solution that goes to zero plus the soliton uh, mm -hmm. is uh, like there is a soliton to which uh, it con Q converges or will the soliton uh, changes because uh, the the velocity is, uh, the C will change uh, won't converge uh, when uh, as time goes by yeah oh it's okay. Uh, yes, so, so that's that's another option. So it, I think for most most of the time, uh, you, you will converge locally to a, a specific soliton. But I think you can cook up situations where the uh, you don't converge to a specific soliton, but the uh, the velocity sort of doesn't settle, right? Uh, but in principle, in most cases, you should have something like that, right? You you, you cannot converge globally to the soliton but you can converge locally to it that is on any compact set or on any compact set that uh, follows the, the solid okay well thank you thank you all for attending this lecture have a nice uh, have a nice week and see you next tuesday bye bye Thank you for the lecture. Bye. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Ari.